The re reason that you are here tonight is to learn about um, some of the issues that we have here in Missouri with some of our reservoirs um, and ponds uh, with, um, with algal blooms, you know, and some of which can actually be toxic. Um, and we're lucky to have the, the expert on that to join us here tonight and, and actually share the real info with you about that. Um, I wanna let everybody know if you're watching on Zoom, you should at the bottom of your screen have a Q&A option. And <clears throat> that is probably the best way to submit your questions um, if you have questions for Rebecca. Now, what we're gonna do is hold those questions till the end and then I'm gonna ask those on your behalf to Rebecca um, and then she can answer uh, whenever, whenever she's ready. Um, and I know some of you will end up using the chat field as well. That works too. I'll be kind of going both between both of those. Q and A is the best. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and put your questions in the chat for YouTube. And um, Melanie is also watching that, and we'll try to get those questions over to us so we can throw them at Rebecca. Um, because when it comes to issues of lake pollution, um, she is one of the best in the area to to answer your questions. Um, I want to give a couple thank yous out to, first of all, obviously to Melanie, my wife, who is, you know, kind of overseeing things from the background and making sure that I've pushed all the buttons I need to. Um, she's already saved me a couple times tonight. So thank you, Melanie. Um, she also put together the slideshow that we were showing, if you tuned in earlier, while we had some music playing. Um, we also had slides from 2019 from River Leaf events and Melanie went through all our photos and pulled out the best ones. Um, so th that's always fun to watch. And also a thank you out to River Miles, um, the organization that puts on the MR340, and they have sponsored our live streaming for the Big Money Speaker Series. So thank you to Scott and Kate for um, kicking in and making that happen. Really appreciate it. So I am going to turn everything over to Rebecca. And Rebecca, you are, I believe, unmuted now. Um, and if you can go ahead and turn your video on, I think that's actually going to be the best way to go about this. And you can go ahead and share your screen when you're ready, and I think we're good to go. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca. Um, and I did forget to give the briefest introduction. Rebecca is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri School of Natural Resources. Um, and she is a limnologist who studies um, lakes, reservoirs, and other bodies of water. Um, and she is the co-chair of the MU Limnology Lab. So um, thank you so much for putting in the time to join us tonight and share what you've learned, Rebecca. Thank you, Steve. You can see my second slide now. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about Missouri reservoirs and trying to address uh, whether or not they're toxic. So as a limnologist, I spend my time studying water bodies. Uh, they used to look like this. So I do hail from the Great White North and I used to sample water through meter thick ice in the wintertime. Uh, winters here are a little bit different. Uh, my family and I moved here about four years ago uh, to start this position here at Mizzou. So as mentioned, uh, I'm a co-PI um, of the MU Limnology Lab, and this is our, our new reveal here of our, our logo that uh, Tony Thorpe made for us. And you'll notice on this logo that there's lots of water bodies, um, but none of them are kind of that circular basin shaped lake that you would expect. Um, and this is because there is no water bodies in Missouri that look like that. We have no natural lakes. There is oxbows, which look more kind of like rivers, and then these water bodies depicted here, which are reservoirs. Um, so here, you know, you can kind of see the linear component, which would be the dam, and then all the different embayments and things off of it. So today I'll be talking about data collected on Missouri reservoirs. So we know that globally, both lakes and reservoirs are getting greener and are predicted to become more toxic. The image you're seeing now is a satellite image from the western basin of Lake Erie. The blue colors here are water and the green is an algal bloom on top of the water. So this bloom is so large that it can actually be seen from space. 
And so we're finding more and more occurrences of this happening all over the world. This particular bloom uh, led to a crisis in Toledo, Ohio. So here on, on the shore of one of the uh, largest lakes in the world, a great source of fresh water, uh, about half a million people in Toledo, Ohio didn't have a safe source of drinking water. And that's because the algae or phytoplankton in this bloom produced a toxin called microcystin and that contaminated their water supply. And so basically they just had to turn the taps off for four days and it resulted in about $65 million in lost benefits and cost the water treatment plant in Toledo about $4 million. So there's lots of socioeconomic uh, and uh, environmental issues related to these harmful algal blooms or cyanohabs, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. So most of us like to swim in lakes and recreate uh, in nice clear blue ones that look like this. And it's not too often we're keen to jump and, and enjoy waters like this. Um, so the blue water here is blue because there's very little algae in it, uh, whereas the green colors here uh, are composed mostly of phytoplankton or algae. And so of many, many different types of algae, cyanobacteria are one type. And these are the ones that tend to form these noxious blooms and have the ability to produce toxins. And so the message to the public, generally speaking, is when you see green water that looks like any of these variety of images, it has the potential to be a cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom and it has the ability to produce toxins. And so you want to tend to avoid uh, blue-green waters like this. And, and unfortunately, around the world, we're starting to see more and more signs like this posted on, on water bodies on a year-round basis. Uh, and we know that this happens most often in the summer. And we're seeing, again, more and more of these likely because of increases in air temperatures and then water temperatures as a result of climate change. So this is one of the most seminal papers uh, in limnology called Blooms Like It Hot. So increasing water temperatures is, is one good theory as to why we're seeing more of these blooms. And there is some, unfortunately, serious human health risks associated with them. So if you see a sign like this posted uh, around the water body, it's probably advisable that you stay out of it. Um, there's many ways people can be exposed to cyanobacterial toxins. You can ingest or inhale them during recreational activities. So even though you're not in the water, if you're boating on top of the water or along the beach shore, there is the potential to inhale them that way. And so these toxins can aerosolize and they can be ingested. It can also go up through the food chain. And so algae are the base of the food web. And so everything eats everything else all the way up to fish and then humans. And so we found that it can, the toxins themselves can make their way up into fish, which are then consumed by humans. And of course, as Toledo, Ohio found out, uh, it can also be consumed through drinking water. We do know that most of the drinking water processes have the ability to remove toxins. In the case of Toledo, it was just so massive and the population that needed that water was so large that they just couldn't keep up with the demand and turning off the tap was the only risk, uh, was the only way they could avoid the risk. And so we know that all of these uh, routes of exposure can cause kind of immediate or acute effects. There's also chronic effects associated with exposure to toxins. And so we know that kind of continuous exposure has the ability to produce tumors, which may then lead to cancer. Um, so there's lots of long-term and short-term risks associated with the ingestion of algal toxins. And unfortunately, we're seeing more headlines like this um, all over the US. And so lakes are getting greener and becoming more toxic on a worldwide basis. What we hear about most often in terms of, of, of fatalities is related to dogs. Um, so this is an image of a woman and her dog who were enjoying a, a summer's day on this green water. And unfortunately, this is how the day ended up. So the dog here, Fina, ingested the hepatotoxin, so a liver impacting toxin, microcystin, and, and died within the day. Um, so we know that we are seeing more incidences of, of dogs who may not be as selective uh, at their water sources as our humans. And so one way to kind of think about this and try to look at things that may be impacting, something must have changed to cause these changes in, in the increase in algae. And so the, the common factors that we look at are light. So cyanobacteria and algae in general are photosynthesizers. So they require light um, to be able to grow and produce toxins. Uh, as I said, blooms like it hot. Uh, so changes in water temperature could be associated with that. 
And just like uh, crops and, and plants on the, on the terrestrial landscape or on the land, they need nutrients. And so most of the time we're talking about the macronutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. And so when we add those to our landscapes, they can end up in our water bodies and fertilize the lakes as well. And then of course, there's top-down factors. So things that eat the algae, any changes in those populations. And so here, this image is meant to be uh, zebra mussels or drycenids, um, could also impact things that are, that are causing more increases in the algal growth. So kind of stepping through all of these factors, um, we know that if we have the right combination of things, we can get too much algal growth. And so nobody wants to swim or drink out of this water. Um, but in addition to that, you can get the wrong type of algae. And so this is what cyanobacteria are. So there's lots of algae out there. Many of them are good. Uh, this is one of the, the bad players. Uh, so here, this one we call uh, the pearl necklace. So you can see all these cells attached. Um, in addition to the ability to produce toxins, we also find that cyanobacteria are really poor nutritional source to the rest of the food web. So they're effectively empty calories or junk food for fish and higher trophic levels. So there's not a lot of good reasons to have cyanobacteria dominating your water body. But cyanobacteria are not all bad. Uh, so if everybody wants to take a nice, deep, relaxing breath, they actually produce the oxygen that you're breathing today. So they're the oldest organisms on Earth and have evolved many different mechanisms that allows them to outcompete these other types of algae. As I said, they produce cyanotoxins and it's more complicated in the fact that they produce a variety of them. Uh, the ones I'll be talking about today, the most common are microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, but they also can produce anatoxin and saxatoxin. And just to, to overlay onto that complicated scenario, uh, not all the toxins have the same impact in terms of, of human health. So liver toxins, such as microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, are hepatotoxins. And so symptoms are associated with your liver. Neurotoxins, such as saxatoxins and anatoxins, often result in paralysis or seizure. And you can also get dermatoxins. So these are kind of not as uh, life-threatening and tend to be irritation to, to skin. So depending on the type of toxin you have, you're gonna have different symptoms. On top of that, uh, many different types of phytoplankton produce many different types of toxins. So for example, the hepatotoxin microcystin can be produced by any one of these types of cyanobacteria, including microcystis. So even if you measure this in the water, the toxin, you can't necessarily associate it with the guilty party that produced it. And so there's lots of different cyanobacteria and some of them have the ability to produce toxins and some of them can produce multiple toxins. So it makes this even more difficult in terms of, of monitoring and mitigation strategies. And so my, my subject of today or something I wanna kind of test our assumptions on is whether or not hot spots and hot moments in cyanotoxin production are happening in the cold. So when I was a young uh, undergraduate student and took limnology at the University of Waterloo, uh, a bit of tongue in cheek here, but it was defined as the study of lakes located within 60 miles of a major university campus, but not during the winter. Uh, and unfortunately, this does form the basis of most of what we know about lakes. Um, our technicians, our undergraduate students who are mostly available during the summer months. Uh, so we don't know a lot about what happens in lakes in the winter. And this is becoming even more of a problem because winter is changing. So we know our winters are getting shorter. Uh, we don't have a lot of baseline data before they started getting shorter to kind of make predictions about what things are going to look like. Um, but modeling work and predictions do indicate that the percentage of ice-free winters will increase from two to 60% by the end of the current century. So we, we may be headed to a future uh, of no ice cover. And so it's important to understand what happens when we have ice cover so we can make predictions about what happens when we lose it. And one of the things related to that is how important is winter, right? Uh, I think before, because of logistics and other reasons, uh, we tended to ignore it or assumed nothing happened during the winter. Um, but you know, if a tree falls in the forest, uh, does it make a sound? And so in order to kind of fill in some of these gaps and blanks, uh, we've conducted a variety of cyanotoxin studies here in Missouri. Uh, we've been looking at that hepatotoxins, microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, 
uh, for there's a historical data set uh, from 2004, and then the rest of them are these monitoring programs since 2017. And more recently in 2018, we also started monitoring for anatoxins and saxatoxins. Uh, but my talk today, I'll focus on the microcystin and salinistromopsin because they're the more common uh, things to look at. We also have a project where we're looking at toxins in water and seeing if they can get into the food web and, and what their concentrations look like in fish tissues from an agricultural reservoir. And then we have a citizen science uh, program called ROS, Reservoir Observer Student Scientists, that look at year-round cyanotoxins. So I'll be kind of touching and using data from, from a variety of these programs. So I am learning as, a, as an assistant professor that you can't be in all places at all times. And so in our lab, we rely heavily on community scientists to collect a lot of the data that I'm presenting today. Uh, to date, most of it has been from the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program, or LMVP. So this has been running for 28 years here in the state, uh, where a variety of, of different uh, volunteers monitor our reservoirs for toxins in addition to other water quality parameters. Uh, it's funded through the Missouri Department of Natural Resources and ultimately from the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, a new community science program that we just started a few years ago, as I mentioned, is called ROSS. So this Reservoir Observer Student Scientists. And in this case, we're getting high school students to go out and sample weekly at their local water body or reservoir uh, for toxins and additional water quality parameters. So between these two programs, we've got some pretty good temporal coverage. Ross, uh, I'll talk about the program we have here running in Missouri and have been for three years, but uh, it has previously been funded by the North Central Region Water Network, which has allowed us to expand the program up uh, to the northern states as well. So we have five states currently participating in the program, ranging from Minnesota uh, down to Missouri and Kansas. So we have this nice gradient as well in latitude. So the data I'll be presenting comes from 110 reservoirs spread across the state of Missouri. So every MU symbol you see on this map is, is a reservoir that we've monitored through any one of these programs. Uh, those of you who are familiar uh, with Missouri will know that the northern part of the state, the dominant land use is agriculture. And so those reservoirs tend to be on the greenish side. Whereas in the southern part of the state, we have forestry, uh, forested kind of natural landscapes in the Ozarks. And those tend to be our, our better water quality or clear blue type reservoirs. Um, so we wanted to have this nice gradient, which we call a trophic gradient. So from really clear to really green and be able to test different factors impacting cyanotoxins. We also have a temporal gradient. So our statewide lake assessment program is, is your classic monitoring where we go out once in May, June, July, and August in the summer and collect a sample. This is supplemented by this community science program, Lakes of Missouri volunteer program that go out from April through to September and collect water samples. And then now with the high school students, they're able to go out and collect weekly water samples year round. And so with these different scales, we can look at these temporal gradients as well in cyanotoxins. So moving on now to some results. Um, in, from 2017 to 2019, we collected about 1,400 microcystin samples. Uh, these are whole water samples and we use an ELISA or an Abraxas kit to analyze them. So out of all these water samples that we collected, we detected microcystin 38% of the times measured. So under half. These are the concentrations. So here again, we're showing the map of Missouri. Uh, anything with a red circle has greater than 1.6 micrograms per liter of maximum microcystin concentration. So these are the highest concentrations measured, ranging um, from those highs down to the lows. This is actually pretty good news, uh, even though it does seem like a lot of angry red circles on here. Uh, the recreational guidelines, so this is for swimming and boating and recreating, the EPA has set a limit of eight micrograms per liter. So anything less than eight is not concerning. And so as you can see, we're, we're well less than eight uh, at most of our water samples. What's interesting about this figure is the fact that if I was to guess, I would have put all those red dots up here in the northern part of the state. Um, we know that that has the most nutrients and tends to be the greenest water. And so it was surprising to see that we had this whole spread um, of these higher microcystin concentrations across the state. The other toxin I'll talk about is cylindrospermopsins. This is another hepatotoxin or liver toxin. 
uh, again, in that same two or three year time range, we collected about 1,400 samples, but we only detected it 15% of the times measured. So significantly less than when we collected microcystin. And so here you can see a similar map across the state um, with the red now indicating greater than 0.7 micrograms per liter. So not as many detects or high concentrations and definitely well below these EPA recreational guidelines, which are now 15 micrograms per liter. So we're well below anything that's of concern. Um, but again, it's interesting to note that they're relatively spread across the, the trophic status or from the Green Lakes to the Clear Lakes across the state. And so as a scientist, I like to kind of get in the weeds. Um, and so even though these concentrations are all really low and not concerning for recreation, we still wanted to see what were good indicators of toxic lakes or reservoirs. And so here I'm showing the microcystin concentrations that we collected. Uh, so again, the N equals about 1,400. The number of samples is about 1,400. And you can see here we're, we're well below limits um, and comparing it with the greenness of the lake. And so we measure green uh, as an indicator of algal biomass. And one of the quick and dirty ways to do that is just to measure the pigments that algae produce, which is chlorophyll A. So here I'm showing the chlorophyll A concentrations. You can see we have this huge range um, from almost nothing to, you know, this, these are really, really green at over 150 micrograms per liter. But what you'll notice is this is not a significant relationship. So had this been, you know, high microcystin meant green reservoirs, you would have seen a correlation coefficient around one and a really nice linear relationship. Instead, it's pretty scattered and the relationship is pretty weak. It's positive, so it does indicate that the higher chlorophyll, the higher, higher microcystin, but it's a really, really weak relationship. And you can see here, we can have really, really green reservoirs that actually have no toxins. We can also have pretty toxic reservoirs that aren't that green. Um, as you'll notice here, I've separated them into non-summer and the red circles and summer and the blue triangles. And so you can see that there's quite a few non-summer um, samples that were relatively you know, higher in that toxicity range. So it's not just that assumption that most uh, lakes and reservoirs are the most toxic in the summer. Looking now at that other toxin, salinospermopsin, we can see uh, even poorer relationship between this indicator of algal biomass or chlorophyll A. Uh, it's a really weak relationship, but it's interesting to note that it's actually negative. So the clear lakes tend to have the higher salinospermopsin concentrations. Again, the actual concentrations are really low uh, and not above those threshold guidelines. But it is interesting to note that there is quite a few non-summer high concentr or, you know, higher concentrations as well. Um, so not kind of meeting our assumptions of green equals toxic. So one of the things that we, we question when we look at this is that we're using chlorophyll A, which is an indicator of all the algae. And does it truly represent the cyanobacteria or are we, we missing the signal for the noise? And so this is work done uh, by my undergraduate, previous undergraduate student, Kyra Floria. Uh, she went out to dairy farm lakes. So as, as aptly named, it tends to be rather green. Uh, it is located about Midway, Missouri, and it's on the Kaffner Experimental Ag Station. Uh, she went out in the summertime every two weeks and collected a sample to see if we could somehow look for a relationship between algal biomass or chlorophyll A and specifically cyanobacteria. So here's her results. Now we're looking at cyanobacteria biovolume. So these are just the ones that have the ability to produce toxins. And they're shown by these green bars. And then we have the microcystin concentrations in these red triangles. And so what I hope you'll note is this kind of opposite relationship they seem to have. So when chlorophyll is high, we see relatively low toxins. And when toxins seem to be high, we have low cyanobacteria biomass. And so kind of similar to what we were seeing with that larger statewide data set, um, there doesn't seem to be a good relationship between toxins and green water. So the studies I've talked about so far tend to be uh, summer centric, right? So focused on those warm summer months. And so my master's student, Emily Kinzinger, decided she wanted to see what was happening in the off seasons. So what's happening in these Missouri reservoirs when no one is looking? And so now I'll present some of her data uh, from local reservoirs. So we'll look at data from Stevens Lake, uh, which is located here in Columbia, Missouri. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we rely on our community scientists to collect a lot of these uh, resolved temporal samples. And so in this case, the samples were collected by the Mizzou Soil and Water Conservation Society. So undergraduate students, uh, specifically Nathan Waller, Owen Gallagher, and Lydia Jefferson just signed up to do this year. We'll also talk about Bethel Lake. So this is located close to Rockbridge High School and they can basically walk right over from the high school to sample it. Um, and they've been doing so for three years as part of the Ross program. Uh, Greg Kirchhofer is the teacher there through AP Environmental Science. So thank you to him and all of those students that have participated. And then the third lake I'll talk about is McDaniel Lake. So this is the drinking water source for Springfield. And we have a very willing uh, utilities manager there, Carrie Wilkin, who goes out and collects these samples and then sends them to our lab for analysis. So thanks to community scientists, we now have this wonderful year round data sets. So I don't know if anybody remembers the news uh, in the fall of 2018, but right before the Roots and Blues and Barbecue Festival, Stevens Lake looked like this. So very green, this is a picture taken from a drone above. Uh, when you do a close up, the water looked like this. Um, so obviously not very appealing for swimming. And so they abruptly closed the beach on Stevens Lake. So you recall there's a, a, a public beach uh, just located over here. Um, but of course, the next question then became, was the water toxic? And so we coordinated with government agencies in the city to go out and sample it. And here's some of the data. So again, we're representing the algae by chlorophyll A, and that is these green uh, squares. And then the toxin microcystin is these orange circles. So here in August is when things started looking concerning and you can see the data back that up and, and the algae were quite high concentrations at that time. So around 40 micrograms per liter. But then the population started crashing into September. When we went out and sampled during that bloom event, it actually had quite low toxin concentrations. So microcystin shown here. So we think that you know it, it, it kind of built up to this bloom condition and then it was as the bloom was dying and crashing that's when uh, the microcystin concentrations were, were higher during that peak. So we see that even though it looked awful and green, it was not actually that toxic. Um, what's interesting about this data, I find, uh, is the fact that the maximum microcystin that we recorded that year in 2018 happened during, again, the off season or the non-monitored period in November. So this is good for all lake swimmers, not too many people out in November, uh, but it's, it's a time when we're not thinking about looking for cyanotoxins. It's that kind of unmonitored season. And so was 2018 weird or did this type of thing happen all the time in Stevens Lake? So again, thanks to the LMVP program and the volunteers from the Soil and Water Conservation Club, we have data from three years, so 2017 to 2019. Um, and so you can see here for microcystin, it's, it's not a dissimilar relationship to what 2018 represented. So the highest chlorophyll in green here is still occurring in the summer, right? So around July, starts dropping down in August and September. But the maximum microcystin that we see happening, again, well below any EPA threshold, uh, is actually happening outside of that season. So it's happening in June and it's happening in, in November. And so we get the highest toxin concentrations outside of the summer period. Salinus bromopsin is, is a good news story for Stevens Lake. Uh, so again, here showing the chlorophyll for, pers for perspective, but the only real hit or you know, increase we had in Salinus bromopsin occurred during the month of October, noting here that that's also a time when we had really low chlorophyll A concentrations. So Salinus bromopsin was not also following our expectations of what would happen in the summer. Some results now from Bethel Lake. So again, this is that uh, Rockbridge High School sampled urban pond. Uh, you can see here microcystin is now the green circles and salinus bromopsin is the blue circles. And so what you might know is again, well below any EPA threshold concentrations, um, but almost again, an opposite relationship. So when microcystin is low, salinus bromopsin tends to be high. And when microcystin is high, salinus bromopsin tends to be low, uh, which is you know interesting to have this, this opposite relationship. So you can't just make assumptions about all toxins. It really does matter what type of toxin you're looking at. So this is to kind of put this in perspective and look at all three of these reservoirs together. So here we have Bethel Lake, McDaniel, that's the drinking water source for Springfield, Missouri, and Stevens Lake. And so for chlorophyll, walking into this, the assumption would be that chlorophyll A would be higher in the summer. Uh, things are hot, 
lots of nutrients are usually available, we would expect to have the highest chlorophyll. But as you can see here, when we look at it by non-summer and summer concentrations, they're not dissimilar. So the same letters means they're not statistically different. So we have very similar concentrations of chlorophyll for the summer and non-summer for all of the reservoirs. Looking now at the toxins for microcystin, you can see again, no significant difference between the summer and non-summer with the exception of Stevens Lake. And so again, this is that non-summer spike we saw in microcystin in November. Salinus bromopsin, uh, we only really had a detect for it in Bethel Lake. So it was pretty low in the other two reservoirs, but again in Bethel, it was higher in that non-summer time than it was in the summertime. So it appears that there is quite a lot happening in Missouri reservoirs when no one is looking. And so now kind of to go through back again to these factors regulating algal growth, can we kind of check through these and see which ones we think might be most impacting or causing these harmful algal blooms? So we had a gradient in light. Um, we use a calculation for this light attenuation coefficient. Um, so this is just to show you that we had a large range in light from really dark waters to really clear waters that had a lot of transparency and saw no relationship with microcystin nor slimspermopsin. So light doesn't seem to be driving the toxicity of these populations. How about water temperatures? Uh, once again, in Missouri here, it's wonderful. We have a full range in water temperatures from three to 38 degrees Celsius. But again, we saw no relationship between water temperatures and either of the toxins. Nutrients as the next likely suspect. Um, so again, a range in nitrogen from below detection, so really low up to really high concentrations. And then same for phosphorus from you know, almost zero to really high concentrations. For microcystin, we saw a very weak but positive relationship between the nutrients. Whereas for salinus bromopsin, we saw again, a really, really weak relationship, but it was negative this time. So the lower nutrients had the higher salinus bromopsin concentrations, which is you know, not what you would expect. But generally speaking, you couldn't use nutrient concentrations here in the state to predict toxin concentrations. So there does appear to be this very yin and yang relationship between microcystin and salinus bromopsin. When one is high, the other is low and vice versa. So I'm starting to refer to these as the bizarro toxins. Uh, so it seems that they're not, not behaving as one would predict. And we need to try to figure out what's happening or what, what are we not measuring that we should be that is impacting the production of these toxins. So this is you know, my kind of back of the envelope summary about what we don't know about cyanohabs to date. So unfortunately, we don't have any good early warning signs. It's, it's hard to say which water bodies would be most at risk. Uh, it's hard to tell without actually going out and measuring the toxins and measuring multiple toxins, whether or not a lake is toxic. And again, it depends on which toxin is in higher concentration. When one is high, they're not necessarily all high. We know they're coming from the Santa bacteria, but we don't know why they're increasing. And so which factors uh, are regulating their growth or toxin production? And then one of the really intriguing questions is how long do they persist? So if you see a, a toxic bloom or you can measure it and know it's toxic, how long until that water body recovers and it's safe to drink again, fish from again, et cetera. This is also something we've, we've only turned on to in the last couple of decades. Um, so I've mentioned there's some data that we have from 2004 uh, from Jennifer Graham's work under uh, Jack Jones's purview. And it seems like that is some of the earliest data that we have on a large scale basis for cyanotoxins. So a lot of government agencies are now monitoring for them, but there's not a lot of historical data. And so it's really hard to do any kind of trend analysis to determine if they're actually getting worse or if we're just perceiving uh, that they're getting worse. So just so I don't leave you on a completely depressing uh, note, I wanted to kind of try to provide some, some options for solutions about how to mitigate or what we can do about these blooms. Uh, so this is work that I'll be presenting uh, done by Jacob Gaskell, my PhD student, and he's looking at controlling light. So as I mentioned, you know, light, temperature, nutrients, we should be able to, to cut off the supply of one of those and, and stop the growth of cyanobacteria. So in this case, Jacob's opted to add a flocculant to these big mesocosm tanks to do experiments to try to block out the light. 
So any of you who have vacationed in, in beautiful, pristine mountain lakes um, know that they have a glacial rock flower in them. So as glacials uh, move and recede, they have lots of little particles and clay that end up in the lakes. And this is what creates those beautiful turquoise looking glacial lakes. And so the concept here is to take that flower, um, that's the erosional material, and add it to agricultural systems. Um, so we started off on a smaller scale. I mean, these are, are large mesocosms, um, but we didn't add it to a lake. Um, we just I did an experiment where we added it to the bunch of these different tanks to see if it cut out the light. And, and if so, did it decline the cyanobacteria in those tanks? So this is his experimental design. And so he added this glacier rock flower uh, to tanks where we were growing both cyanobacteria and other types of algae to see if it can control light. And so actually, I'm happy to say that his paper was just accepted today. The timing is good. Um, so this is uh, going to be published in a month or so in Frontiers in Environmental Science. So we can see that when we added this glacier rock flower, so no glacial rock flower in the light blue, and the dark blue is the addition of glacier rock flower, it significantly cut down the light. So this is photosynthetically active radiation or light. And so we know that, you know, the addition of them cut down the light and it, it kind of went back up or it, it recovered after about four hours, but it maintained itself beyond into six hours. So, so the plan was to add it and reduce light and that was successful. The next step was, does it actually minimize cyanobacteria? So I know this is hard to read, but basically this is the beginning of the experiment and this is the end of the experiment. And we're showing the bio volume of algae and breaking them into cyanobacteria, harmful algal blooms in the black and other types of phytoplankton. And so you can see here at the beginning, we had a community that was dominated by cyanohabs, but once he added the glacier rock flower at the end of the nine days, that population declined 78%. Um, so even though the quantity of algae is similar at the end, the population had completely changed and it replaced those, those bad cyanobacteria with a better type of phytoplankton that doesn't produce toxins. In this case, it was cryptophytes. And so on, a, on this scale uh, and from this experimental approach, it was successful and it seemed that you know, minimizing the light uh, did achieve the desired result. The catch <laughs> is the scaling up. Uh, so after purchasing this glacier rock flower, which is, you know, actually from, from the Rocky Mountains, they were mining it and uh, adding it at certain rates, we did a back of the envelope calculation and figured that for an average sized reservoir, we'd need to add about 40,000 kilograms a day of glacier rock flower. And given the current uh, rate, uh, what that cost, it would be about $36,000. So. A bit impractical for most small reservoirs, one of these, you know, theoretical experiments that, that worked, but the application of it is probably uh, impractical. So uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, we do think that our indicators of toxic reservoirs or, or greenness are failing us. Um, and we do need to kind of focus and try to find some, some different ways to mitigate cyanotoxin production and protect human health. Um, I'd say the likelihood of toxins is still pretty unpredictable. And currently, I think the only advice I have to give is, is to measure the toxin concentrations everywhere all the time um, and don't make assumptions about when you wouldn't expect them. So with that, I would like to acknowledge our funding agencies and welcome any questions you may have. Rebecca, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really excited that we captured this on video because I'm definitely going to have to watch that again. Sorry, a little catch. fast. <laughs> no, you did super great, super great. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's a lot there, right? And you know that's what makes these kind of talks so great is we can kind of go back and um, and and ask ourselves questions and then sort of ask the, your content questions. But we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, and I think that um, <clears throat> I may actually, I was gonna try to share my video, but it won't let me do that anymore. And that's fine. I don't look that great, honestly, anyways. So the first question is from David Owens. And he said, so 
you know, trying to capture this like difference between the algal, algal population and then the toxins they produce. Are the toxins a byproduct of the al algal crash? Does the death and decay of the algae result in the toxicity? It there certainly contributes to it. So the toxins are located within the cells themselves and they can be released, dissolved into the water. And so that's why the case in Toledo, they ended up just turning off the taps because typically when you have water quality issues, you, you boil the water, right? To try to get rid of any pathogens. But in the case of cyanotoxins, if you did that, you would break open those cells and actually increase the toxin concentrations. So yes, I think that as algal cells are dying, um, in a lot of cases, they're breaking open and, and releasing more toxins. Uh, there's, there's details there. So different algae uh, do that and some don't do that. And it depends which toxin, but generally speaking, yes, they're in the cells and in the water. So when they die, they increase. So to sort of take that one step further in the example that you showed of Stevens Lake, um, where we had the sort of al algal bloom and then crash, and then the surprise release of toxins a month later. Um, I know that you don't know this, but like, is that sort of the suspicion that um, that the, that crash is what ended up causing the release of toxins later? Yeah, so it could be that degradation of the algal cells too. Um, the other theory I have on that is, um, okay, forgive me. When you go swimming, uh, your feet are usually colder than the top of your body. And so we call that stratification. And so in the summer, the warmer waters are warm by the sun. The top waters are warm by the sun and they're warmer. And then you have these bottom cool waters. And it's enough of a gradient that phytoplankton can't cross over it. And so they're kind of stuck in the top. And then in the fall, as things cool down, that density gradient disappears and the whole water column mixes, call it fall turnover. And so what could have been happening there too is that pulse of toxins that came up was in that bottom water. And so it was when the physics of the system changed that it then mixed up um, where we could detect it. Um, that sort of leads to another question. When sampling a place like Stevens Lake, you have volunteers that are out there sampling. Is, is there an attempt to sample those different layers um, every time or um, how do you approach that? Yeah, no, we just collect surface samples uh, with the volunteers because, well, we don't have boats to provide all of them. <laughs> uh, so it's shoreline sampling. And Stevens is nice if you've been there because it's got that walkway mm -hmm. right across the middle of the lake. So that one's a nice one to do that. But yeah, there's surface samples. So we give them a little bucket on a stick. Um, and so they stick that into the water. You know, we always advise them to try to avoid the surface scums uh, and get a little bit deeper down. But yeah, they're just collecting that one top layer. Okay. Um, and Stephanie was wondering, <clears throat> what's the natural way the toxins are broken down? Um, I mean, I think you addressed this already, but it's an interesting you question. Take a step later, further. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> it, when you look back, because they were around before there was predators, before there was humans, before there was anything else, and producing these toxins. Um, you know, lots of people would say it's an anti-predator technique, it's, you know, all of these things, but when you look at the history of things, why it's energetically expensive to produce toxins. And so why would a cell do that if it didn't have to? Um, so we think that there's, you know, underlying reasons why they're doing it, uh, that the toxins, the, the toxicity of the toxins is, is a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the toxins themselves are being used to get nutrients is one theory out there. So they tend to be kind of sticky so they can put them out there and grab the nutrients that are in the water and the cell can use it. Um, I don't think the point is to harm humans or, or other wildlife. I think they, they are produced for something else. We just really haven't quite figured that part out yet. And I imagine it's different for all of these different toxins, but I think another thing Stephanie's kind of getting at is, you know, I mean, is it, is it light or oxidation or what are sort of the actual processes that turn toxic water into not toxic water and what happens to those, those actual toxic materials? 
Yes, the only thing that's been really effective, like in terms of drinking water, for example, is activated carbon. Um, so you can actually, you know, put them through cartridges and, and remove it that way. The problem is it's really hard to do on a large scale. So if it was a small drinking water plant or, you know, something that was, was small in scale, you could use activated carbon, but, you know, Toledo, Ohio, half a million people, it just wasn't, wasn't feasible. Um, so, so far, that's really the only way, well, that's the only use of water that makes it economically reasonable to kind of look at these solutions. Um, and that's been the only one that's been successful. Um, another question from Joe, he's saying, uh, asking, have you looked at the different algal species and the chlorophyll A and toxin producers? That's his question. I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at, but you might. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> so, so the reason we use chlorophyll um, is because volunteers can go out and pour water onto a filter and we can analyze it for like a buck a filter. If we wanted to know what the species were of all the different phytoplankton, uh, then we would have to get a, a taxonomist, a phycologist to look at the sample and they run about $250 a sample. So it can be done. I would love it for it to be done. Uh, we do have boxes and boxes of preserved phytoplankton samples for that intended purpose, just not found the budget yet. Right. So not, not on all the samples, not on that larger scale. Right, got it. Yeah, that sounds intense. Um, uh, so Stephanie was asking, why do you think that it was the light rather than something actually in the rock flower that made the big difference um, in, your, in your students' um, study? Yeah, we tested the rock flower for, for the different components of it. Um, the only thing I was a little concerned about or we watched for was changes in nutrients. Um, so sometimes there's a lot of iron or manganese and things like that in, in a flower like that, and it would precipitate or would pull out the phosphorus. Um, so we monitored all the nutrients throughout the experiment and didn't see a change. Um, so we don't think it removed nor added uh, any nutrients to the water. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, Arthur is asking, I think you kind of addressed this question, but if you, if you think of anything else that you wanna to add to it, he asked, does lake turnover affect your sampling? And at what depth is sampling done? Yeah, so we're, we try to be aware of lake turnover. Uh, we have, in a lot of them, uh, systems set up. So little sensors on a weighted line that are continuously monitoring water temperature. Um, so for the high school, for the Ross programs, all of those lakes have that. So we know when turnover happens, um, but we don't get the students to adjust their sampling. Um, so they're still collecting that surface sample. And then, you know, after the fact, we download the temperature data and then understand when turnover occurred. Um, so we don't adjust the sampling to reflect that. Okay, so so once again, robots are the answer, and you just need a bunch of androids out there to uh, do this work for you. Yeah, um, waterproof androids. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, Bob Steyert over in Kansas City is asking, uh, what are your expected predators, and do they live in the winter? So I assume he's talking about predators on the algae, but I don't know. Yeah. So uh, in a lot of cases, it's the phytoplankton and then they're eaten by zooplankton, which is like Daphnia and the little kind of clear bugs that you would see, and then fish. Uh, and then the other thing that we have been looking at too here in Missouri is the impact of zebra mussels, because um, they're also predators of phytoplankton. They're filter feeders. And so they sit on the bottom and then they suck in all the lake water and then they pull out the algae and eat that and then uh, continue that way. So in a lot of places, mostly the Laurentian Great Lakes, um, and I say that because there's lots of Great Lakes in the world. I did my PhD work on the African Great Lakes. So we differentiate the North American Great Lakes by calling them Laurentian. Uh, so they have obviously zebra mussels there and they found that they don't like uh, cyanobacteria. And so they tend to spit them back out. And so what happens in that scenario is they increase um, the concentration of cyanobacteria in the lake through their feed eating. So they're eating the whole population, but they're keeping the good ones and spitting back out the cyanobacteria. 
And so they're actually increasing the cyanose in that case. Um, so we looked into that. Uh, this is another work by Jacob Gaskell, the impact of zebra mussels here in Missouri. And they don't seem to be doing the same thing that they do in the Laurentian Great Lakes. Um, so we haven't seen much of an impact at all. There doesn't seem to be much change uh, in, in the phytoplankton, in the chlorophyll A concentrations, or in the turbidity, because they tend to clear the water column. Um, so yeah, we don't think as, as grazers or as predators, we're as worried about the benthic, um, such as mussels. Um, and so from, from a fish perspective, the evidence so far on winter limnology, again, we just really don't know a lot, uh, but there's been a lot of recent effort and, and interest in working in the winter. And it seems like fish still eat and, and feed and, and do everything they would do at a normal level. Um, so we're assuming that there's not a big seasonality to that component. Amazing. Okay. Um, the questions keep rolling in, so I'll keep feeding them if you're going to keep answering them. Sure. Um, Steve Olson is wondering, what are the EPA criteria based on, and do you think they are where they should be? <laughs> well, that sounds like a trick question. Uh, you so, might have been a government employee at one time. Right, yeah. Uh, they've just raised uh, those criteria this year. So they used to be lower, um, which would be maybe more protective, uh, and now they're higher. Um, so they base this based on a combination of lab studies and, and this kind of monitoring uh, national lake assessment program is, is something that goes across all of the US and monitors all the states and so that's another thing is you know not all water bodies are created equal, um, but yet we make these guidelines that are supposed to go across all of them just because of you know political and geographical boundaries. Um, so, for instance, Canada right now is, is developing guidelines for the first time, and their numbers are significantly lower. So there is large range in that, um, but given the current guidelines, we're well below it here in Missouri. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question from David Owens, how does the production of toxins relate to the algaes? Um, reproductive cycle? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think um, that is well known. Uh, algae reproduce asexually as well as sexually. Um, so there's a lot of nuances uh, in that too. So it only probably be, you know, lab-based studies that would have, have looked at that. And I, I can't think of any offhand that have. Um, so I think, you know, when the going's good, uh, they'll, they'll reproduce and, and their populations will grow. Um, but in terms of, of how they're doing it, again, that would be species specific in terms of phytoplankton. Some live in colonies and some are just little single cells. Um, so yeah, it would be complicated and I haven't seen anyone link that yet to toxin production. Okay. Um, Anna Miller is asking, could silt be used to reduce the light availability akin to the glacial flower in the experiment? Missouri has an abundance of silt available. <laughs> well, and that's actually, we do think why we don't see as many toxins. So Iowa, Kansas, these other states have much higher toxin concentrations than we do. Um, and so we think in a lot of cases that might have to do because there's not a ton of light um, because of that turbidity. Um, so it might be, you know, a, a blessing in disguise in some cases. Uh, the clay was nice because it was so light that it floated on top as well as kind of mixing in. Uh, the silt would fall out much more quickly. Um, so all those numbers I put up in the expenses would probably increase, well, I guess, if you're getting it for free. Um, and then the other concern, of course, is, is the volume. So we're a bit concerned here, maybe not as much as Kansas, about our reservoirs filling in. And so if you're going to start adding a bunch of silt to it, you're going to have less volume uh, to dilute any kind of incoming pollutant or, or toxin as well. So there'd be pros. Yeah, always the unintended consequences. <laughs> um, and actually, I uh, um, a couple of weekends ago, I was helping out as a safety boat on a canoe float. And you know, we were all noticing with the lower water in the Missouri River, which is where we were, we were on the Missouri, um, how much clearer the water is, which often happens when the rivers are lower for kind of a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is kind of, you know, the more of the water is coming from reservoirs than it is from tributaries. Um, but there's, you know, it's kind of a pattern. 
And I was talking to somebody that works at the water plant in St. Louis, and, and he said that once the turbidity drops like this, which happens often in the winter, but when it happens in the summer, um, often they will get kind of algal blooms in the river, and then they have to start adding um, carbon, like you, you mentioned, to actually reduce that flavor that all the algae adds to the drinking water. Um, so that's kind of interesting that the silt in the water actually keeps the algae from growing because it reduces that light that it's getting, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's so. So if, if you want algae to grow, then then give them more light and, and then vice versa as in the experiments that we did. There's still quite a few more questions, but, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a few more. We'll sort of see how, how you're feeling. Um, Carolyn from St. Louis, Carolyn Pufalt asked, um, so given this variation, what is the best way and timing to routinely test for toxins? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as often as possible, um, you know, reality hits, it's, it's difficult. Winter sampling, there's a reason we don't have a lot of data. It's very logistically difficult. Um, that's why we were using the water treatment plant intake in Springfield, um, because effectively that's just a pipe into the lake that you just turn on a tap and you get a sample year round. Um, so I'd say, you know, don't make it more difficult than it needs to be if there's a resource like that. Um, and that's, you know, the easiest way to tie into these things and be able to use people that are already collecting water for other reasons and then just get the toxins on top of them. Um, I mean, currently the government agencies are, are definitely doing the summer sampling um, and responding to calls, right? So if somebody calls and said things look really green, then MDNR will come out and collect a sample. Um, so it's, you know, it doesn't hurt to be observant. Um, as we mentioned, we assume all this stuff is happening in the summer, but you know, we can get cases, especially as our weather changes and, and things are, are a little more um, variable, then we can, there'd be more reason to pay attention all the time. Uh, one other question um, from Rob Jacobson. Um, he actually asked a few questions which you've already answered. Um, he says, it's good to know that concentrations are mostly below EPA standards for humans. Um, what about toxicity to invertebrates or native fishes? Like how, how, does, how does that vary as opposed to like the levels that we give to humans? When do um, our animal populations and invertebrates start getting impacted? Yeah, so there is some evidence that they do increase up the food chain, like mercury or, or some of these other compounds. Um, so it would matter where on that trophic status they were they were feeding. Um, so I guess yeah, if you would expect to see the highest concentrations, you know, you'd go to to the biggest fish that are eating the most things. Um, from a human perspective here, so because there, there's these liver toxins, they tend to accumulate in the kidneys and livers and these organs that we tend in our culture just not to eat. Um, so, you know, the fillets and things like that, that humans are consuming or that wildlife would consume um, from the fish uh, might be not that concerning. I actually do have a colleague that worked in Africa where they would eat the whole fish. So more like sardine type little small fish. Um, and then it was a bit more concerning and they were exceeding the, the WHO, the World Health Organization standards um, for human health. And so I would imagine that would be the case with wildlife as well. Um, but again, linking these things are, are often not done, right? If you have you know, wildlife deaths, it's not often associated with then let's go sample the water. Um, so I haven't seen any really strong cases of linkages. Um, we do know that, uh, so the, the Hitchcock movie, The Birds, the reason the birds were acting so erratically is because they think that they ingested some cyanotoxins. Um, so there is kind of this circumstantial anecdotal evidence um, of wildlife consuming cyanotoxins and behaving very strangely. Um, so, you know, there's a bit out there, but I've never seen a real concentrated study. It's kind of, you know, yeah, anecdotal. Wow, okay. Um, <clears throat> always more complicated than we imagine. I think I'm just gonna go with one more question here. Bob Steyer had, um, and, and he's really, so he says, what do the limnologists studying red tide in the oceans, which I guess limnologists, do they study ocean water as well? Or is that 
Well, now, now I get to lecture like I do in my in my limnology class and say the definition of limnology is the study of inland waters. Got it. Um, so oceanographers are equivalents on the salty waters. Okay, so he's wondering if the oceanographers studying red tide in the oceans say how the red tide is reduced and would that apply to inland reservoirs? Yeah, so it's a similar scenario. Instead of it being cyanobacteria that produce the toxins, it's, it's dinoflagellates. It's other types of, of algae that I didn't talk about today that produce the toxins that cause red tides. Um, so yes, it's you know all of this stuff you know that regulates uh, phytoplankton algal growth would apply to both. Um, and you know there's some some differences between those way those organisms uh, react, but yeah, there's a lot of similarities and, and lessons that can be learned and, and shared among them. Awesome. Um, well, a lot of thank yous from the chat um, for your great talk. Um, and you, yeah, we all learned uh, more than. I don't know. It felt like I took a college class, which is the kind of talk I really love. Um, thank you so much for like digging deep and sharing uh, not only the little pieces at the bottom that we need to understand the big concepts, but like all of the details of your research. We really appreciate that. Thank you yeah. for taking the time. No problem. I have my email down there. If anybody has follow up questions or or wants to wants to email me, feel free. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Rebecca. And for everyone else that's still with us, um, again, our next talk for the Big Money Speaker Series will be October 20th next month. And Craig Pockert will be joining us from the School of Natural Resources talking about fish migration as part of World Fish Migration Day uh, celebration, I suppose. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, we're still kind of figuring out what the rest of the year will look like for the speaker series, but we're going to keep 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 it on Zoom for now and hopefully keep recording uh, and sharing these talks so that you can share them with your friends that can make it tonight. So um, thanks to all of you um, for showing up. We'll see you next time. Thank you.